But so if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts 17. I, I need to be careful because I get too nostalgic and I'll just talk too long. Um, I'm going to preach tonight. Again, I've, I've been trying to follow some simple things. You know, as I study and go through these things that I have preached on before, uh, <clears throat> simplicity really is deep, though. Even though it's simple, uh, we ought to make things simple for ourselves and for everybody that's listening, that we can understand, even a child can understand. And I, I hope I've been doing that. I want to do that again tonight and on throughout the week. Not cute sermons or funny sermons or dynamic sermons, just the simple, plain Word of God, the Gospel, and, and responsibilities that we can all understand and equate to. Now, here in this chapter of uh, Acts 17 is a, a story that we're familiar with. I, I'm sure if you've been in church for any length of time, you've heard more than one message on Mars Hill or about Mars Hill or about what took place on Mars Hill. It, it's a fascinating place to be. If you've gone on one of the Holy Land trips, I know... Uh, I, I believe I was on nine of them, but we only went to Athens maybe on four or five. But I've been there four or five times. And Athens is a unique city, even to this day. It's a city built on hills. It has the, the antiquity to it. Uh, Athens is some 5,000 years old, 3,000 B.C., and uh, was, a, was a great world-renowned city when, uh, when Greece ruled the world and then uh, has kept on with its reputation to this very day. I think in Athens today, half a million people live within the city limits than, of course, the outlying areas. But back in those days, it was a large city, perhaps 200,000. And it was a beautiful city from all accounts that we have of history. It was an interesting city. It was a military city. It's a city of arts and theaters and entertainment. But it was a city without God. I mean completely without God. It was a heathen pagan city with no standards, no morals. Uh, without God, you have no morals. And uh, so this city, if, uh, like many others, like most others, needed God in a, in a very desperate way. Now, they had education, philosophy, and I say arts and entertainment. And they used to just kind of make an entertainment out of listening people, uh, even listening to people talk about religion. And they had a place where they met on Mars Hill, Areopagus. And it overlooked, kind of in a high place, overlooked the city. And you could stand there, even to this day you can. And you can look at the ruins of those temples on the high hills of, uh, of Athens, at the Parthenon, where the, where the false temples were to the false gods. And uh, it, it, it should stir your heart. If you have a love for God, when you, when you think that people had spent all that money and effort and worship on false gods and never knew the true and the living God, this is what happened to Paul. He was there, uh, of course, nothing ever happens by chance, but he was there almost like a tourist. And he'd been sent there, was waiting for some men to come and accompany, him, accompany him. But while he was there and walking about the city, he, he saw these things that moved his heart. And he preached this very brief sermon. I'm going to skip some of the preliminaries and go right to verse 23. This is where he makes his statement. Whereas I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, Corinth was another city some 40, 50 miles from Athens, a, a, a very important industrial city and again a very wicked city. And uh, Paul said to the church there, after he'd found the church there, he said, Some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Now, here in Athens, no one had the knowledge of God. As far as, as far as we know, there were no Christians in the mind of God, in the heart of God. This phrase that we've used over since the, the uh, church planning uh, session here, I have much people in this city. God knows who they are because He's God. He knows who He's... Uh, going to deal with and who's going to respond and who's going to be converted and saved. He knows all of those things before they happen. Now, don't try to get theological with me and say, well, if he knows everything's all going to happen, well, I'll just sit down and take it easy and won't worry about it. No, God has not only the plan of what's going to happen, but how it's going to happen, who he's going to use to make it happen. And if you refuse to do it, he, he'll take those blessings that could have, could have been yours and just give them to somebody else. No big deal about Roy Thompson coming to Cleveland starting this year. No big deal. 
If I had not responded to that call that I felt God wanted, somebody else would have. I mean, God's not dependent that much on me or any individual. He's going to let somebody ruin his plan or destroy his plan. And so uh, Paul said uh, they don't know and they need to know. And, and I'm saying that it's your fault that they don't know. You know there are people in Cleveland, young people, teenagers, school children, working people, adults that don't know God. I mean, they know something about God, but they don't know God. And I'm telling you tonight, I speak that to your shame, to the Cleveland Baptist Church's shame. Now, this week, one great thing about, uh, about the uh, Smite program, you couldn't buy the advertising you're getting just having these buses go all over town and run up and down the streets and, and young people getting off the buses that look neat and almost civilized and human, you know, and, and then working with these other children. I mean, it's the best. I, I, after breakfast, early breakfast, with, with the pastor, I don't know he got up at early, I wouldn't have gone to breakfast with him, but uh, we had an early breakfast, and then I went for a walk, and I needed that, and I was down in the park, and I, I'd just gotten down there, started up, I have a certain path that I walked down there, and there was a gentleman there, I don't, I don't, I don't see him here tonight, but he was he had his car hood up, and he had, he was listening to something there, but he stopped, and he looked, he said, are you Roy Thompson? I said, uh, yeah. And, uh, I'm always afraid to answer that because I don't know if I, I better duck or run or, 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 or if they have a rest warrant or what. But he said, boy, there's some sermon you preached last night on the rich man of Lazarus. And he was here at church. I don't know, not a member, but he was here. And we had a nice chat and everything. Just, just out of the blue, just met this fellow. Everybody I'm talking to and witnessing to, mostly in restaurants. For some reason or another, that's where I seem to meet the most people. But but they know they already know about the program. I mean, uh, they live in a neighborhood out here where one of those are. They see the buses, and somebody's already talked to them, somebody's witnessed to them. And, and so a lot of things going on that are going to acquaint people with the Cleveland Baptist Church. And I'll tell you one thing. If you get acquainted with the Cleveland Baptist Church and you attend here, you're going to learn about God. You're going to learn the truth about God. Plenty of these people go to large cathedrals and churches and hear sermons, but nothing really about God, nothing really about the Bible, just philosophy and religion and so on. So this is what Paul, he saw these people, they went up on Mars Hill and they gave speeches and talks and philosophies, and I'm sure they were orators, and uh, they, they argued things, they debated things. And I have some people say, well, you shouldn't argue religion. You haven't lived yet, man. If you haven't gotten a good religious argument, you don't know what living is all about. And I mean, I, I like to, to duke it out with somebody, a Jill Witness or Mormon or Christians. And that's good for you. It gets the blood flowing and gets your mind working and everything. Don't be afraid to, don't be afraid to witness because you don't know everything. I mean, there are plenty of things I don't know, but I know more than they do. I'll tell you one thing. I know God. I know about God. I know about salvation. And, and I know they don't have it if they're believing what they're being taught. And so this is what Paul argued up there. I want to talk, I want to take that phrase, and maybe we'll get into some of the others if we have time, but to the unknown God. And he said, I, I want to declare him unto you. <clears throat> now, now, if you have a family or friend or neighbor or fellow worker that doesn't know God, it's your responsibility to teach them about God. You, you teach them by the way you live. You teach, I'll bet, I'll bet you if you work in a factory, an office, where there are a number of people, there are a lot of people in there who use bad language. I, I'm sorry to say there's some Christians that do, or weak Christians, or backslidden Christians, but I mean, it's very, very common today, when, when, when I was a young man, when I was a boy, you didn't hear that kind of language in public. I mean, you just didn't hear it. Somebody, some man would, would even say a, 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 just a, a, almost a slang word, and he would be uh, berated because there were women present, or there were children in the area, but today... I mean, you hear the vilest, vulgarest language that there is right out in public. So, so they don't know God. And you, you can expect that. I used to get mad. I, I used to by getting fist fights over that. And you, there's no sense. It's unreasonable. They're just the way they are. That's their vocabulary. And they're not saved. And uh, overcoming the use of bad language, like overcoming uh, drinking booze or drugs or something else. We had, we had a phrase in the Army when I was in the military. The second time I was a Christian. I'd been born again. And somebody got some stickers. We plastered them all over camp. Uh, cursing is the effort of a feeble mind 
trying to express itself forcibly. I like that. Think about that. Learn that quotation, you see. Men think that if they speak uh, with vulgar language that they're making themselves more forceful, you see. So the world does that. So you hear them talking. Well, if you're a Christian and you work there and they never hear that kind of word come out of your mouth. You see, that has an effect. You're teaching them something about God. And it's your job to do that. If you never light up a cigarette, if you never drink booze, if you never go to their parties, if you never listen to the vulgar jokes, if you never do those things, if you're helpful, if you're kind, if you're considerate, if you're compassionate, they're going to see you're teaching them about your God. And they're going to learn. But Paul was saying, they don't have any knowledge about God. It's your fault. I speak it to your shame. I'm, I'm telling you this. If your neighbors don't know you're a Christian without you wearing a sign or without putting a neon light on the porch, if they don't know you're a Christian, there's something wrong in your neighborhood. If you haven't shown them by your life and by your testimony and other ways about your God and about what you believe, you see. So he says, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to speak this to your shame. I want them to know. Athens didn't know, so he's going to teach them. I want you to know this. You cannot know God by logic and by reason. You just can't. See, this is what they did. They, they sat around there. I don't know if you've ever done that. Just listen to men banter back and forth and argue back and forth. And, and this guy sounds good and then that guy sounds... We have to be careful as, as Bible-believing Christians that we pick up on some of these cute phrases that we think really expresses the divine truth. And it doesn't. If you really get into it and think it through, it doesn't. If we're speaking for God or about God, where we're teaching people what He's like, we better use Bible language and Bible truth and Bible logic and Bible reason, you see. But we get into it, we use it ourselves, we're in trouble because you cannot know God by logic and reason. It may make you think about God. But it will not teach you about God and it not revi reveal what God is really like. Use all the logic you want to. It, to me, really, Calvary and what Christ did for us is almost illogical. It is not logical that God would send His only begotten Son to die for people who hated Him. To die for people that cursed Him. To die for people that deserve to go to hell. It doesn't really make any sense or reason or logic. And yet the Bible is filled with the truth that Jesus Christ loved us so much and God loved us so much that He sent His only begotten Son to be crucified, die on the cross, pay for our sins so we could have salvation. Now, nobody's going to reason that out. <clears throat> Nobody that doesn't have a Bible or doesn't go to church, had not heard a sermon, is going to sit down. Well, let me see now. I think I... I don't know who God is, really. I don't know if He's a, a person or a, if He's just some kind of power or whatever. And I'm just going to reason this. No, it won't work. You will not come to that conclusion. You will not come to know God by logic and reason. You will not come to know God by human wisdom and education. And I'll tell you, a lot has been said from this pulpit uh, for the 37 years I was here and the past eight that Pastor Folger has been here, a lot has been said from this pulpit about human education and public education. There was a time, mind you, there was a time in this great country, it, it just, I just have, it angers me so much, frustrates me so much, that, that these intellectuals today and these people in high office are trying to convince us that our Christian wasn't founded, that our nation wasn't founded on Christian principles. I mean, it, go to Washington today. They're they're making one of these judges the other day, or two or three of them got together. And they told this this judge in this courtroom down south, somebody, you got to get those Ten Commandments out of there. Get them out of there. It doesn't say anything on this uh, plaque that they're from the Bible. It doesn't say anything. They're God's word. It doesn't say anything about religion. It just lists. The Ten Commandments that God gave to His people. That's got to go. You can put every devilish and wicked philosophy there is on a plaque and hang it up anywhere you want to, but you put up anything about God, and it's got to go. So you can't. 
There was a time when you could learn about God in the public school systems of our country. They actually read the Bible. They actually prayed to the God of heaven. They actually prayed the prayer in Jesus' name. They actually gave assignments to students to study the Word of God. And gradually we abdicated that right we had. And, and the devil and wicked men and intellectuals came in and put all of that out of the school. No Bible. There isn't a school in the United States. If they have one, they have it illegally. No teacher can read the Bible in the classroom or, or, or in an assembly room in a public school. That is illegal. Elementary school, uh, Christian, do you know we have a, we, we have a law here that's required. I don't know if it's a law or an ordinance or what. But in Ohio, when a, when a man goes to school, he cannot have a Bible and carry a Bible, read a Bible, share the Bible. But when he goes to prison, they have to give him a Bible. Yeah, they do. They give every, every man goes to prison. Just like when I went in the army, they gave me a uniform. They give him a Bible when he goes to prison. If they'd have given the Bible, if they'd allowed us to pass out New Testament. I think, Pastor Folger, I think this church would provide a New Testament for every student in the public school system in Cleveland, Ohio. They were allowed to do it. They're not allowed to do it. You can't give them out. Not allowed to have it. So they've said, no God. So you cannot know God, you cannot learn about God in the public school system, either on the elementary level, the secondary level, or, or the postgraduate course in college. You cannot learn about God. It's impossible. That's how, you see. No Bible. Now, you, I, I guess they can have the Koran. I don't know. They can, have, they can learn about the Greek gods. <laughs> they can study all that stuff about how about some idiot called Zeus and Eros and all those gods and goddesses by the hundred? They can talk about that. They can teach it. They can have part of the curriculum, but nothing about God. Do you know what is unique about Christianity is that we believe in one God. Christianity is exclusive. We can't team up with somebody else and say, Oh, yeah, come on in, bring your God, and bring your religion. That's what we're doing in the music field. The devil couldn't get in. Even among the evangelicals, couldn't get in the inner circle that says, Jesus Christ is the only Savior, God is the only God, we have a triune God, a biblical God, and, and all these things about God, and they couldn't get inside that circle. So they got their music inside the circle. They're going to do everything they can to say, look, it's not as exclusive as you think. Come on, let, let everybody know we can't let everybody in. That, that's, in, that's in Christianity in general. And in this church, if the President of the United States, God bless his heart, if he walked in this church and sat through a service and, and, and came forward and, and got saved, or if he said he was saved, and I'd like to be a member of this church, he could not join if he didn't have scriptural baptism. Doesn't matter how high an office a man holds or how well educated he is, or how much money he has, you talk about exclusiveness, we say, first of all, you can't get in the family of God and the circle of God without the new birth, without being saved. And after you're saved, you can't get in the New Testament church unless you submit yourself to scriptural baptism. That's what people don't like. When a church demands a regenerated, baptized membership, that's where you start cutting a lot of people out, see and so they, why well, we can't get in? How are we going to, how are we going to get in? We'll get in with the music. I mean, I'm not, I'm not just harping on music now. I, I, I'm sure there's some music that nobody could not like the music that this choir has sung, or, or the specials have been done, or the congregation will sing. Uh, they may not, they may like some others better, but, or, or not the right choice out of the hymn book, but nobody can be upset with that. But, but let me tell you, if they could get their rock in here, they'd get their rock in here. And their devilish music, their, their, their carnal music, music that, uh, uh, music that uh, does not honor God but dishonors Him. That's one way. That's just one way they're getting in. There's other ways the devil's trying to get in to destroy Christianity. See, it's everybody against Christianity. The Buddhists are not going to... They're, they're not going to fight the Shintoists, and the Shintoists fight the Christian Science, and the Christian Science fight the Jehovah Witness, and the Jehovah Witness fight the more. They all get along, and they're fine. Everybody's fine. Have your own thing. They don't go around 
putting anybody down. You know, you, what they say, oh, you're saying your God is better than any other God. You got that right, brother. My God isn't better than any other God. My God is the only God. There is no other God. That's what we have to get these people to see and learn. We must teach them. They must find that out. They're not going to find it out with logic and reason. They're not going to find it out with human wisdom and education. No way. They're not going to learn about God by science and deduction. Now, human wisdom and education uh, may give them a desire for God. You know, there are people that know nothing about the true and the living God who have a desire to know. There are people that know nothing about the living God that think about God, and, and, and they can't know God to His fullest degree by those things, nor by science and deduction. That will show you God's power. We can, study, we can study the stars, the planets. We can learn all about science, true science I'm talking about. Just like in everything else, there's true science, there's false science. We can learn the truth about science, and science will not bring us to God. I, I'm sorry. It will show us God's power. It will reveal God's power to us, but it will not bring us to a saving knowledge of God, you see. And that's what we're concerned about. That's what we're talking about. That's what Paul was talking about. Is showing them. Look at in this, in this uh, text that we only read the one verse. I'll just go through a couple of things here. Uh, he, he, first of all, he, he tells them that God is unknown to them. And in verse 24, he shows that God is the Creator. He's made all things. I, I, uh, I love the Bible for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons, that it's, very, uh, it's, very, it's very short and brief about what it has to say. So, sometimes people take uh, one little question that is asked and they give about a, a 165-page answer. I don't need that. Give it to me concisely. And this is exactly what the Word of God does, you see. We, we have spent our lifetime studying uh, evolution and its counterpart. Or I should say creation and its counterpart evolution. And we, we study that. We have books. We have millions of books. We have, we have uh, schools and colleges that teach it. And we come to Christianity and we say, Oh, boy, I just read my Bible. I get everything I know here to, to confront uh, scientists. Now, you, you're not going to learn the truth about God of creation uh, in a scientific manner. Now, now, mind you, this Bible has science in it. It's not a scientific book, but it has science in it. What it says about science is absolutely right, you see. And so you, you gauge everything. When we uh, establish the Heritage Christian School here, you, you're supposed to have for your school, let's see, I, think, I can't think what they call it now, um, these, these uh, rules and orders and... Uh, Scope and sequence. Okay. And you have a philosophy of education that you present. And, uh, and at, at that time, I don't know if we have the same one now or not. I'm not trying to say I'm any brainy person. But this was my idea of Christian education. You take all the books there are, all the science books, all the, all the uh, history books, all the geography books, everything. You pile all these as high as you want to, and you put this on top. And then anything you read in any one of these books that disagrees with this book is wrong. And the Bible is right. How important, don't you see the importance we have? Because what we know about God, we learn from this Bible. So he says, God is the Creator. And then he says how to worship God, verse 25. And he says how He made all nations of one blood, in verse 26. And then he tells us where He is. He's near. You know how far God is away from you? If you're not saved tonight, He's a prayer away. He's a breath away. That's all. That's all. And then He says we, uh, we came from God in verse 28. And, uh, and He says that God is our judge in verse 31 to 34. The ending of this, I'll make reference to that. He says He's our judge. Now you can't, by science and deduction, you cannot come to know God. You're wasting your time when you try to argue with people about science, creation, and evolution from a biblical standpoint. I'll tell them what God said. That settles it. They might twist my mind. I don't have a great scientific mind. They may ask me a thousand questions I can't answer. All I know is God made it all the way it is. That's what the book says. And isn't it strange that He only gave us basically two chapters in the whole Bible to tell us about creation. 
You know why? Because He spoke it into existence. He tells us what He did and how He did it, and that's all. He didn't go into any uh, any deep details about it. You either believe it by faith or you don't believe it. Now, I, I happen to believe that God is the Creator, that God made everything, that, that God is the author of everything. I don't, I, don't, I don't read the other books. I don't listen to what the other books have to say. I don't need to know what they are. I used to study religion. I used to study false religions. Until I, I mean, my mind was spinning. I don't do that anymore. I don't read about the Mormons, Joe Witnesses. I don't read about any of those people. I don't worry about it. Anybody I come in contact with, I've got the weapon to fight them. I don't need to know what they believe. I know what the truth is. And the truth is the weapon that we use. We don't use our own arguments. We don't use logic and human reason to teach people what God is and who He is and how we know Him. We don't use wisdom and education. We don't use science and deduction. We use the Bible to show them the truth about God. We cannot know God by by religion and human revelation. Boy, that's a big thing today. We've got a lot of compartments to Christianity that call themselves and consider themselves to be, and they're basing their truth and their doctrine on their own emotions and their own revelations and their own experiences. You know what happens to this? I have a little... I have a little thing that I tell people about this because people will bring this up to you when you witness to them. You, you, you try to tell them how to get saved. Say, well, I had a, I had a friend, you know. That's always, I had a friend or I had a relative or I knew a man that, that got saved and uh, supposedly got saved and, and then he, uh, and then he became a, a wicked man again and I guess he lost his salvation. So they, they are, what they're doing, their friend, is interpreting the Bible on the basis of that man's experience. What we need to do is interpret that man's experience on the basis of the Bible. The Bible doesn't say. The Bible says, no, he never was saved. I think, you know, we want everybody to be, of course, we want everybody to be saved, but we're willing to sometimes, because they're a friend or a relative or a loved one, we're willing to check away all our beliefs. And here's this guy, came to church for a while, made a profession, now for 40 years, been out living in the world and drinking up and cussing and and involved in the world, never goes to church, doesn't pray, doesn't read the Bible, doesn't think about God. No, we just know a man. We don't know a man who got saved and then lost his salvation. We know a man who said he got saved. When you get saved, brother, and we need to preach this more and more, when you get saved, the Bible says you are a new creature. Old things pass away. All things become new. Where is that today? I, I, I honestly detest the, the phrase, easy believism. I detest that phrase. Because uh, what men are trying to say, well, you're not winning these kids to Christ. And, you know, you, you're just saying, believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. I said, what do you want, hard believism? I'm telling you, salvation is simple. Faith is the very basis of it. It's the most simple thing that there is in a man's life in the Bible. And you get it by hearing the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Faith is a gift to God. Faith is what saved us. For, you, for by grace you are saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The faith that you believe with is something that God gave you. Salvation is of the Lord. <clears throat> the whole thing from beginning to end. But I think we've come to the place where just because somebody made a profession or somebody said they were saved at some time, somewhere in their life, and they've never shown any evidence of it, we just... We're willing to chuck everything away and say, oh yeah, man, if they ever just, if they ever just said, Lord, save me, man, I'm saved. I think we're missing something when we say that. Uh, man, you, you don't, you don't, it's these people, they, 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 they're saved by their experience. They're saved by their feelings. They're saved by the, their emotions. And, and that's simply religion and human revelation. You can't know God at you can't know God that way. Uh, you may have a, a feel for God. As on the other, you may have a thirst for God. You may have a, a, a desire for God. Or you may see God's power. But if you want to know God, if you want to really know Him, there's only one way. And that's by divine revelation. So this is a divine revelation. There was a time when God spoke through His prophets. There was a time when God spoke through the patriarchs. There was a time when God spoke to men individually. But in these last days, 
God has spoken unto us by His Son. And when somebody tells you, I don't care how successful they may be or how nice they may dress or how many viewers they, ha they may have on television or how many people they may have in their congregation, if they tell you anything about God that is contrary to what God has revealed to us, they are a liar. I don't, care, I don't care how many degrees they got or what denomination it is or what anybody says about them or how good a person they may seem to be. If they're giving you knowledge of God, if they're giving you knowledge of sin, giving you knowledge of salvation, apart from this Bible, you can just check it. It's no good. Anything we learn about God that is true, that is right, that is forceful, has to come by divine revelation. No God. You remember when Peter, he was a fellow that so many of us men can relate to. He could say so many foolish things. Pastor, we've made a few guffaws, and I will never bring that up again until tomorrow night. But uh, I've, I've got my share, and, and we were talking about some of them today. We've all made those. That, that's true. And, and I guess that's why I equate to Peter, because so many times he said so many almost dumb things, foolish things, or wrong things. I, I don't believe he meant to. He probably sincere, a slip of the tongue, whatever it was. You remember the occasion when they came back um, from the city and Jesus began to ask them, Who do men say that I am? And one said, Well, you're John the Baptist. And one said, You're Elias. And one said, You're one of the prophets. And so on. And then he said, Who do you say that I am? And, and Peter, right away, spoke up immediately and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Simon Barjonas, flesh and blood had not revealed that to you. What? Uh, human reason, reason, logic, and human uh, wisdom and education, science, deduction, and, and human revelation. That is, my Father, which is in heaven, has revealed that to you. And then just not even 20 sentences later, Peter says to the Lord, I'm not going to let you go up to Jerusalem. I'm not going to let you get crucified. What are we going to do? You're our leader. You've got to stay with us. We've got to protect you. We've got to look after you. And Jesus said to the same man, just a few seconds or a few minutes before, that said, Thou art the Christ, the living God, and flesh and blood not revealed it, my Father which is in heaven. Now says to him, Get thee behind me, Satan! For you savor not the things of God, but the things of man. You see, he was talking in the flesh. He was talking with his own mind. He was talking with his own emotion. We love you, Lord. I mean, it wasn't that Peter hated him or Peter uh, uh, didn't want him to go someplace or do something. It was he was really protected. I'm going to protect you. We're not going to let you get crucified. We're not going to let you go up there. We're not going to let people mistreat you. You see, but he had no knowledge. His, his, it wasn't knowledge, it wasn't revelation that told that. It was his feelings, his adoration, his love, his grace, his compassion, his wanting to be with the Lord. But it was wrong. I mean, you could have admired, you, you, could, have, you could have said, Lord, Lord, why would you say that to Peter? Why would you say that? He, he was just saying good things about you. He was just concerned about you. He just cared about you. How could you be so thoughtless? No, he didn't. He was speaking with his own mind and his own logic and his own reason and his own emotions. If he would have read the Word of God in the Old Testament time and time again, literally hundreds of prophecies that said Jesus must go to the cross. The Son of God must die for our sins. The Son of God must be the Lamb of God that brings us salvation. If he had read those things and believed those things, he never would have made that statement. And I'll tell you what, you would be ten times better off never to give somebody an answer as to give them the wrong answer. You'd be better off to say, I don't know, I'm not sure, I'll pray about it. i ask my pastor, i ask another Christian, I'll try to look it up in the Bible. But sometimes we just don't like to do that. We just, well, let's see, it seems to me like this would be the way to do it. Yeah, that sounds all right. Uh, somebody gives you a question on morals or, or divorce and marriage or or on some kind of sin. And you say, well, you know, it seems to me like it. that's the way to do it. And, and you just think you're, you're wrong to do it. If you give somebody an answer, if you're going to try to help somebody, you need to give them the revelation. That's why, let me say it again, that's why the Bible is so important. If there are errors in this book. We're finished. We're finished. We've got to find 
a guru someplace. We've got to find a leader. We've got to find a man who knows where those mistakes are. I, I, I've been told and I've read and I, people have argued with me and debated with me that hold an opposite view that, well, it's only about 5% of the Bible that might have some mistakes in it. Which 5%? I mean, if it's got three errors. I, I have men who love God and love this book, but they've been caught up in this thing and almost rather say, you know, preacher, that's not a very good translation. Are you... You know, that doesn't seem like that ought to be there. And, and they're good men, but they're not thinking straight. If there's mistakes in here, then we don't have a Bible. We don't have a perfect book. We don't have a good revelation. This is God's revelation. You can count on it. It's always right. Now, men use it wrongly. But see, we're not supposed to use the Bible. We're supposed to allow the Bible to use us, is the thing. So do you know God? You can only know God. I've got much more to say about it. You can only know God. You can only know about sin by this revelation to you. Nobody that has a lick of sense, nobody that has a third grade education should be able to say with any certainty that, oh, homosexuality is just a lifestyle. After all, it's what people have chosen to do. And you know what? The majority of America is saying that now. Oh, it's a, you know, baby, a, a baby, it's not a baby, it's a fetus, not a real life, it's, it's all right, you can do that up to six or seven months, that's okay. They can get that out of the Bible. There's, any, there's a verse of Scripture in the Bible that remotely would give you any kind of idea. That's their thinking, that's what they've listened to the world say, that's what they've listened to the intellectuals say, and, and they're using the wrong kind of reason. If you want to know about sin, you've got to read the Bible. You want to know about God, you got to read the Bible. You want to know about salvation? you got to read the Bible. Because in this city, in these hundreds and hundreds of churches we have spread around this great city of Cleveland, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of ways to be saved. To become a member of the church, to become a member of the family of God, to get to heaven. There, there's absolutely dozens. And if we're not careful, we've heard so much about it, we've read so much about it, if we're not careful, we're out witnessing, we're willing to give in and sacrifice a little bit just to make sure we have a nice witness with them. Oh, I, well, I go to church, but, you know, our church, we run, run. Oh, oh, yeah, well, that's good, I'm glad you go. No! It's a false church, false religion, false doctrine, false salvation. I'm not saying you should j just make yourself mad at them or them mad at you or offend them, but tell them the truth! There's only one way of salvation. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross, shed His blood for your sins. And you must believe that He died and He was buried and rose again and asked Him to save you. You've got to share the truth. Quickly, now let me give you that. Look at the last verses. Because every time we have a service here, tonight, tomorrow night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, over in the other buildings, one of three things is going to happen. Here it is. One of three things. Some mocked. When, verse 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. There are people that come to this church and sit and listen to pastor preach or a guest preacher preach, and they walk out here and they think it's funny. They think it's humorous. They, what, what are you talking about? People rising. They wouldn't talk about Jesus rising from the dead. And they mock it. They, they really laugh. They may not do it out loud, but in their heart, they laugh. And then others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. That's the procrastination. You could be here tonight. Maybe there's one unsaved person, or even two in this auditorium. There are many over the young people. And you could say tonight, well, I'd be, you know, that makes some sense, and I'm, I'm not really against it, and I'm not making fun of Brother Thompson, I make fun of the sermon, but, but wow. I just, I, I gotta think about it some more. I gotta consider it. I gotta take it home and, and mull on it and, and, uh, give it some consideration then maybe, okay? How be it? Thank God for verse 34. How be it? Certain men clave unto him and believe. That's only one of the three things that you can do tonight. Even as a Christian, really. Because Christians go through the same process as the unsaved. That's why we're always... I mean, I, I don't, I'm not necessarily in favor of just everybody going to the altar, every service. I mean, I feel every time I hear somebody preach to me, I feel like I ought to go to the altar. And I do occasionally, and I, I think it's fine, and it's a place of prayer and to do business with God, but... But I'm talking about when people get away from God, far away. They're backslidden. They're not where they once were. They're not studying the Bible, reading the Bible, praying 
in fellowship with God, serving God and witnessing. I'm talking about that. You react the same way an unsaved man or woman does. You just say, oh, I've heard enough of that. Man, Thompson, Folger, all those preachers, all those youth directors, all the people, all those, you got to do this, got to do that, got to do this. I've had enough of them. Just laugh about it and go. Or you may say, well, it makes a little sense. I'll think about it. The best thing you can do is say, no, I believe that. I'm going to cleave unto that. I need that. That's what revival meetings are all about. Let's bow our heads in prayer, please.